Hello and welcome. On behalf of CME Outfitters, I'd like to welcome and thank you for joining us for this program titled Diagnosing eGPA, Recognizing Signs and Symptoms of the Disease. This program is part of a CMEO snack series supported by an independent educational grant from GlaxoSmithKline. I'm Dr. Michael Wexler, Professor of Medicine and Director of the National Jewish Cohen Family Asthma Institute in National Jewish in Denver, Colorado. I'm joined today by Dr. Anisha Dua. Anisha? Hello, I'm Dr. Dua. I um, am an associate professor at Northwestern uh, University Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago, Illinois. I'm the director of the Vasculitis Center there and the fellowship program director. Thanks for having me. Great to have you. I'm really excited about our program today. First, I'm gonna go over our learning objectives. Really, our main goal today is to help identify best practices and to review current guidelines for the clinical evaluation and differential diagnosis of eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, or eGPA. eGPA is an eosinophilic disorder that affects multiple organ systems. It's generally classified as an ANCA-associated vasculitis but it can affect a variety of different organ systems from the upper airways, including the nasal sinuses, as well as the lower airways, including the lungs, from the skin to the nervous system, from the heart to the GI tract, to the kidneys and other organ systems. All of these can be involved in our patients with eGPA, and it can be quite difficult to recognize because it features so many different organ systems because it has involvement of a variety of different organ systems and can present in many different ways. Now, one of the important components of eGPA is that it has features of both vasculitis and hyper eosinophilic syndromes. It's characterized by eosinophilia and asthma that can be present in eosinophilic disorders, but it also can be characterized by the presence of vasculitis and antineutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies. Both of these types of entities also can have pulmonary infiltrates and renal disease. So it's important to try to integrate how you see these kinds of patients and to evaluate and take a good history in order to identify patients who have both vasculitic features and eosinophilic features and try to integrate it to come to a diagnosis of eGPA. Why don't we go over a brief case and maybe that will highlight how we might approach making a diagnosis of eGPA in our patients. Anisha, do you wanna review the patient case? Absolutely. So this patient is Sandra. She's a 63 year old woman with a history of asthma, chronic sinusitis and osteoarthritis. Her main complaint when she comes in is that she has worsening asthma symptoms, worse cough and dyspnea after a viral infection that she had several months ago. She was diagnosed with asthma five years ago, and before that, did not have any history of reactive airway disease. Her current medications include fluticasone salmeterol combination inhaler um, that was increased from 250 milligrams over 53 months ago to her current dose. She uses an albuterol inhaler. She takes two puffs every four hours as needed. She's on loratadine, montelukast, and also fluticasone nasal spray. The plan is to treat her with prednisone 50 milligrams for seven days and add teotropium inhaler daily. So this is a case of someone that has typical severe asthma. They're poorly controlled, requiring high doses of inhaled steroids and, and, and beta agonists in addition to leukotriene modifiers and antihistamines, as well as nasal sprays. And so as poorly controlled asthma, despite using all of these therapies, she continues to have worsening asthma symptoms. So which of the following findings is most indicative of eGPA as the cause of this patient's symptoms? The correct answer is B, treatment with prednisone multiple times in the past year. While all the other answers can occur and can be indicative of eGPA, it's not uncommon for most patients with asthma to actually have allergic rhinitis and not have a more severe disease. Similarly, there's a large subset of patients, maybe 10 to 15% of patients, who have worsening asthma despite use of high dose of inhaled corticosteroids. And so that's also quite common in patients 
with just severe asthma. One of the unique things about eGPA is having such severe asthma that these patients require treatment with prednisone multiple times in the past year. However, on top of that, it's also important to take a good history that may clue you in to other systemic manifestations of eGPA. So let's review some of the challenges in diagnosis of eGPA. Yeah, this is definitely a challenging diagnosis. We know that this is a very rare disease. Um, it's considered extremely rare. It's estimated at about 5,000 patients in the US. And some of the symptoms that we just even talked about um, and the early, especially the early manifestations overlap with a lot of our more common uh, conditions. And we mentioned a few of them. So asthma is a very common condition. It's estimated from 25 million patients in the US. Chronic sinusitis is estimated at almost 29 million patients in the US. And these different entities can coexist and be early signs of eGPA, but they also exist on their own right. So a lot of times asthma or chronic sinusitis is treated symptomatically, and that can actually lead to delays in diagnosis. Patients are often prescribed corticosteroids for their asthma or for their sinusitis to help decrease the inflammation. And that treatment helps them feel better, but it actually masks some of the symptoms of eGPA. And importantly, it suppresses um, the eosinophils in the blood count. And so that can make it even harder to diagnose because when you're checking labs, you're not gonna notice that eosinophilia. That's one of those clues that lets you know that this is the underlying diagnosis. And so all of this leads to an overall under-recognition of the disease. Um, the symptoms can you know, appear unrelated because they can come in with a flare of their sinusitis, they can have nasal polyps, they can have asthma, and they can vary in severity. So um, it really does matter that these patients are presenting to multiple different subspecialists and we're not always talking with each other the way that we need to be to try to get the entire picture of the patient's story. And so it can just lead to, lead to a really siloed view where you keep treating that same manifestation and just find it to be really refractory to therapy and kind of miss that overall diagnosis of eGPA. Yeah, one of the analogies that some people use is that everyone's looking at a different part of the elephant. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's what happens mm -hmm. a lot in patients with eGPA. The, pulmonary doctors and the allergists may see the asthma component, the ear, nose, and throat doctors may see the sinus disease, the uh, dermatologists may see the rash, the neurologists may see the neuropathy, but it really is important to take good history to try to put all of the pieces of the puzzle together. And I think that's what we're talking about here in terms of having a siloed view of the symptoms. Everyone has to step back and try to see the whole elephant, to see the whole disease unfold in a variety of different organ systems. Absolutely, I think that's one of the harder things to do. And then part of that is really collaborating with all your other physicians and increasing awareness so people recognize that this could be part of a bigger picture. Um, otherwise you kind of keep treating your own, your own area <laughs> aggressively. Um, so I think that's definitely an important thing that, that will hopefully increase the recognition of this disease. Um, you know, the, the ACR uh, did update their classification criteria for eGPA. And I just want to note that classification criteria are not the same as diagnostic criteria. And I always kind of harp on this. Classification criteria are developed to include people in clinical trials. And this is after you already have a presumptive diagnosis of, diagnosis of a smaller medium um, vessel vasculitis. Unfortunately, in clinical practice, it's often used to diagnose the disease. And so it can give us some, these criteria can give us some clinical clues or things that we should look for both uh, clinically in our patients, but also in blood work and biopsy findings. Um, but it is nice that they've been updated, and I'll just go over a couple of those here. The 1990 criteria um, included asthma, which we know is a uh, sort of center of this disease, eosinophilia, um, non-fixed pulmonary infiltrates, a paranasal sinus abnormality, and then, of course, biopsies. If we can get tissue, we love getting tissue, and that biopsy would show accumulation of the eosinophils in those extravascular areas. But the biopsy is not always available. And in those criteria, you always you wanted about four criteria needed to classify a patient as eGPA. Now in the updated criteria, some of the similar things have carried forward, not surprisingly. Um, obstructive airway disease, you get points for that. Nasal polyps, so that paranasal sinus abnormality. They did include um, a point for mononeuritis multiplex. And then for the laboratory or biopsy findings, again, you still have that peripheral eosinophilia, the extravascular eosinophils and biopsy, but they did include two features that might actually take away points, and you're trying to get six points for eGPA classification. So they added C ANCA or anti PR3 antibodies, as well as hematuria. And I think this highlights the fact that, you know, 
we consider eGPA and ANCA associated vasculitis, but it's only ANCA positive about 50% of the time. And when we do see ANCA positivity, we tend to see P ANCA or MPO positivity. So C ANCA or PR3s really should make us think about something like GPA. Um, and then hematuria can be seen when there's renal involvement, but it's less common to see um, renal involvement in eGPA when you're specifically comparing it to MPA or GPA. So I think, again, when you're trying to nuance between those other vasculitides, this can definitely be helpful in terms of classifying eGPA from those other vasculitides. Again, it's really important that you view these as in the context of vasculitis, that the patient has some evidence of vasculitis, and then you apply these criteria to help differentiate eGPA from other vasculitides like GPA or MPA. If you applied these on their own, you'd say, okay, well, this person has obstructive airway disease and asthma and nasal polyps. Right. That gives that patient six points. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean necessarily the patient has eGPA. And so you need to actually have it in the context of the vasculitis. 100%. I think that's really critical. You need to rule out mimickers. You need to look for other conditions. And then they really, you're already convinced that they have a vasculitis and then you apply these criteria. So Mike, we'll talk about this a little bit. I know when um, you designed the MIRA trial, we used um, the eGPA consensus task force, task force diagnostic criteria. And so that includes the asthma and eosinophilia, which we know are really critical in, in the diagnosis of eGPA, as well as some of the other um, clinical features. So they included biopsy findings, but also some of the features that you mentioned before, um, including lung involvement, sinonasal abnormality, skin involvement, um, ANCA testing, cardiomyopathy. Can you tell me a little bit about sort of what types of patients were included in the trial and how you applied these criteria? We thought it was really important to actually have some diagnostic criteria. And we really were focusing on having patients who had asthma, eosinophilia, and a variety of other extra pulmonary manifestations. And so that's why, you know, if you just had asthma and eosinophilia, you couldn't get in. Even if you had asthma, eosinophilia, and pulmonary infiltrate, that might just be a diagnosis of chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. Um, but you really need to have evidence of something else beyond just asthma, eosinophilia, and pulmonary infiltrate. Um, and that's why we tried to parse it out and give a variety of different opportunities. Now, most of the patients who participated in the MIRA study that we'll be discussing uh, really had clear-cut eGPA. They had asthma, eosinophilia, and then they had evidence of other organ manifestations. Uh, some of them had cardiac manifestations. Some of them had renal manifestations. Some of them had GI manifestations. Many of them had biopsies, but not everybody. Many of them had ANCA positivity, but not everybody. And so our goal is to have a broad distribution of patients in our clinical trial. So that brings up all the different symptoms that are, you know, possibly expressed at the diagnosis of eGPA. And, and you mentioned a lot of them as inclusions um, options for the MIRA trial. Uh, when we're looking at some of the characteristics of these patients, um, we know that the mean age at diagnosis is about 50 years old, so around 40 to 60. This disease does affect men and women equally. And interestingly, the onset here is 48 years, but the age of diagnosis is 55. And that highlights that there is a delay in this diagnosis. Again, it can be under-recognized. We're often treating with corticosteroids, uh, not being able to catch that eosinophilia um, and sort of broaden our, our differential to include eGPA. Asthma, of course, um, is present in the majority of patients at the time of diagnosis. Um, and it's usually adult onset. Usually these patients have really severe symptoms and are refractory to those high dose inhaled glucocorticoids and are being treated with oral uh, steroids to try to get their disease under control and usually recurrent courses. Um, interesting also to remember is that there's no seasonal variation. So sometimes asthma is triggered by things like exercise or certain um, environmental triggers. And in eGPA, really these patients, asthma is not uh, based on any of those types of exposures. So that can all of those things can give you a little bit of a clue that maybe something else is going on. Other things we see include the lung infiltrates, the sinusitis and polyposis in about half of the patients, um, cutaneous symptoms, and of course, neurologic findings like the peripheral neuropathy or mononeuritis multiplex. And it's also important to note that these are systemic inflammatory conditions. So weight loss and constitutional symptoms, fatigue, um, low-grade fevers, these are all things that can be presenting features or symptoms that these patients will come in uh, with at diagnosis. You know, once they come in, you've got to figure out how do we work them up. And 
Um, different blood tests and imaging studies can be used to try to work up patients with eGPA. I think off the bat when this is, when I have eGPA as a possible suspicion or a diagnosis, of course, we're gonna send the CBC with the differential looking for that high eosinophil count. Um, and as I mentioned, it can be masked by the use of corticosteroids. ANCA tests are sent off. We already talked about how they're positive only about 50% of the time. Um, and it's usually that uh, MPO or P ANCA positivity. But we also need to think about other possibilities. And so peripheral blood smears should be done looking for dysplastic cells, making sure there's no sort of hematologic malignancy, tryptase levels in case there's a, sort of a drug reaction or skin eruption vitamin B12, inflammatory markers, and we want to look for other possible diseases. We mentioned ANCA, rheumatoid factor, IgE levels, um, and a lot of times different types of infections can also cause a peripheral eosinophilia and make people feel sick. So things like aspergillus, HIV, or different helminth infections are things that we really do want to make sure we're testing for. The last thing you want to do is give a patient with an infectious disease uh, more immunosuppressive and then allow that disease to even become worse. Imaging wise, often we'll do a chest x-ray or a CT scan. Again, we think with eGPA, there's more of these fleeting pulmonary infiltrates, but um, manifestations can be variable on, on chest x-ray or CT. And I usually uh, try to get baseline pulmonary function testing to evaluate their, the level of their asthma. Mike, are there any other things that you do sort of in your initial workup? No, I think this is a pretty comprehensive list. The major things are really to rule out infection and rule out malignancy that can also be causing eosinophilia. Um, and or uh, to evaluate what other potential causes there could be for pulmonary infiltrates. So as a pulmonologist, we might do bronchoscopies on some of our patients. But I have a very low threshold, actually, to refer patients to hematology to consider a bone marrow biopsy, for instance. The last thing I want to do is miss out on uh, a lymphoma or a leukemia or some process like that. So I have a very low threshold. Depending on the uh, types of systemic symptoms and manifestations. The patients have fevers, uh, itchiness. Um, and, you know, those are some of the things that might tip me off to say, well, m maybe this could be a malignancy. Weight loss would be another thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Those are all sort of concerning features. And you want to, again, get all of the different views around the elephant to make sure we're not missing a different diagnosis as well. Um, and, you know, the differential is broad. You mentioned a lot of the things. Eosinophilic asthma can be uh, the cause of eosinophilia and asthma. And so it doesn't necessarily mean eGPA. And so you want to look for acute or chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, other hyper eosinophilic syndromes. eGPA is one of them and has a vasculitic component, but there are other uh, types of hyper eosinophilic syndromes that we need to think about. Um, we mentioned that vasculitic conditions can be mimickers and have a lot of the similar uh, clinical manifestations. So there are some clues that can help us to differentiate eGPA from things like GPA or MPA or even polyarteritis nodosa. Those are a couple of the things that we need to make sure we're sort of differentiating between or at least keeping in mind. And of course, you brought up the perineoplastic possibility and, and the utility of maybe using a, or getting a bone marrow biopsy from our hemon colleagues. Um, and here you can see also a couple of different major infections that we want to make sure we're evaluating or assessing for. Exactly. We want to make sure we're not going to missing out on a parasitic infection, a fungal infection, a TB or any viral kind of infection as well. So I send stool for ova and parasites frequently. And I oftentimes send my patients to infectious disease if there's some possibility, if they've got some funny travel history that I wanna help identify what's going on. Yeah. Allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis is another diagnosis. That's a hypersensitivity reaction to uh, different molds and fungi. Um, and can present with asthma, eosinophilia, pulmonary infiltrates as well. It usually doesn't have the extra pulmonary manifestation seen in eGPA. So really important, I think it's really important to think broadly when you see patients with evidence of either eosinophilia or evidence of some type of vasculitis, what else could it be? Because drug reactions can cause leukocytoclastic vasculitis that can also cause eosinophilia as well. So yeah. we wanna to try to consider all these different options. When we talk about biopsying, maybe we should just have a brief discussion. So I mentioned already uh, when I wanna consider doing a biopsy, if there are evidence of B symptoms, weight loss, fevers, et cetera. Um, but what, when else do you consider a biopsy and how does that help inform how you make a diagnosis? 
I think biopsies are wonderful if, if they can help me to, to clinch that diagnosis. They help me sort of make sure I'm using the right treatment. And, you know, if you're using a treatment and patients are refractory, you always wonder if you didn't get that biopsy tissue, do I have the definite right underlying diagnosis? Um, I definitely uh, appreciate skin biopsies. They're very accessible and, and easy to have done. So I work with my dermatology colleagues whenever there is a rash to get a biopsy of it, doesn't bother the patient too much. But I definitely also will obtain um, nerve biopsies if they have some sort of mononeuritis to try to help make clinch that diagnosis and also to differentiate it from other things that can have a mononeuritis um, like the other ankyovasculitides or a PAN or something like that. Um, renal biopsies, I think, are useful in ankyovasculitis. I haven't needed to use so many of these in, um, in eGPA specifically, um, but I think part of this, you know, in that second phase that we think about with eGPA, you see that eosinophilic infiltration of different organs. Now, again, I think it's really going to be based on what's the safest, what's the most accessible, and you also want to make sure it's something that's active. You don't want to sort of biopsy scarred over skin tissue or anything like that either. Um, so I think it does help a lot if we can get a good biopsy to support a diagnosis, but I don't think that's the only thing we can rely on. Of course, we put a lot of weight on the history and the exam and the serologic findings as well and ruling out other causes. Yeah, I like to say if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's probably a duck. Um, and so if it looks like eGPA, you don't necessarily need to do a biopsy. I find the biopsies are most useful to rule out malignancy and infection. But if I am going to get a biopsy, I try to get the most accessible tissue, which is usually the skin, but occasionally I'll do a lung biopsy or a nerve biopsy or a muscle biopsy. What I'm looking for is eosinophilic tissue infiltration. I'm looking for necrotizing vasculitis. Uh, I'm looking for granulomas uh, that are often interstitial, perivascular, and necrotizing. So that's what I'm looking for. Why don't we proceed with our interesting case of Sandra. Nisha? Sounds good. So Sandra was hospitalized for a suspected bacterial pneumonia. She reports fever, weakness, cough, chest pain, and dyspnea. She's had three episodes of pneumonia in the past year. Her first episode improved with antibiotic treatment alone, but her subsequent episodes were treated with two courses of antibiotics and um, prednisone for seven days. So she also had a rash on her bilateral lower extremities that was noted for 12 hours after starting antibiotic treatment. There was concern for an antibiotic allergic reaction, and she was changed from her original antibiotic of ceftriaxone to levofloxacin. Let's go on to our next patient question. This patient's rash, displayed in the photo, is most consistent with which of the following? Well, actually, at this point, it's really hard to discern between different types of rashes. And unless you do a biopsy that gives you a sense of what is going on here, this could be a drug rash, or it could be a leukocytoclastic vasculitic rash that could be seen in eGPA, MPA, or GPA. So actually for this case, for this question, the answer is, I don't know, until we get more information. So let's review a little bit about ANCA-associated small vessel vasculitity. Yeah, so I think we brought up that this, this rash could be any of these vasculitides, or it could be the drug reaction. You know, we kind of anchor that she got the, the drug and then developed this rash a while after, but maybe that was just when it was noticed. And I think it's important to, to think about other distinguishing features. Just by looking at a rash, you're not going to know, you know what it is. And so the other ANCA vasculitides do have some overlapping features, but definitely some distinguishing ones. So EGPA, we know that asthma is almost universal. You have a lot of um, allergic sinus disease. The peripheral eosinophilia is very helpful. And of course, only half, about half the patients can be ANCA positive. It is the least common form of ANCA vasculitis and is one of the reasons that it is rare and harder to recognize. And it's not always included in some of the other clinical trials where we're looking at MPA or GPA. Now, MPA patients are um, mostly ANCA positive and they have a P ANCA or MPO positivity. And a lot of times they'll come in with a necrotizing glomerulonephritis. So renal involvement is really common. Pulmonary capillaritis leading to alveolar hemorrhage is very common. And that's less so the type of involvement that we see in eGPA, although it can happen. Um, granulomatous inflammation on biopsies. We just talked about how important pathology is. You do not see granulomatous inflammation on pathology of microscopic polyangiitis. And then GPA, um, most of those patients are ANCA positive and have a C ANCA or PR3 positivity. And again, when we think back about those 
um, classification criteria that were uh, more updated recently, um, we know that having CNCA or PR3 positivity actually decreases the likelihood of having eGPA. And again, you are gonna see some necrotizing granulomatous inflammation, and this usually affects the upper or lower respiratory tracts. You can have necrotizing glomerulonephritis, which is very common as well in GPA. And you can also get sort of um, ocular vasculitis, even pseudotumors, pulmonary capillaritis, and hemorrhage are frequent. In terms of lung imaging, GPA does have, tend to have very more like cavitary nodular lesions, and that can also be, again, not diagnostic, but help give you a little bit of a clue that it might not be eGPA and might be more in the GPA type camp. Um, I think pathology is definitely helpful, but of course, the clinical syndrome is really important here. So the key distinguishing features of eGPA versus the other vasculitis listed here are the presence of asthma and eosinophilia that are seen in those. And usually less commonly, there's less presentation of renal disease. I do want to make the point that while the vast majority of ANCA-associated eGPA patients are P-ANCA or myeloperoxidase positive, um, it is possible to have a C-ANCA eGPA patient. Not common, but if a patient has asthma, eosinophilia, and presents with vasculitis in one or more end organ, and they happen to have C-ANCA versus P-ANCA, that would still, in my mind, be a case of eGPA. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I think, you know, it's important to remember the patients don't follow the textbook and there can definitely be um, caveats with every patient's story. Um, and with that, we'll move on to back to our patient's story. So on Sandra's physical exam, um, her skin did show this purpuric rash on her bilateral lower extremities. Her neuro exam showed weakness with dorsiflexion of her left foot. And we now finally are getting some labs back, which show a white count of 18.9 and eosinophils of 6.2. Her MPO also comes back um, as ANCA positive weekly. Um, she does get a biopsy done of her rash, and that shows us a leukocytoclastic vasculitis. And the plan at this point is to start prednisone one mg per kg per day, and then add rituximab for induction treatment. Which of the following is the most likely cause of the patient's current respiratory symptoms? The correct answer here is eGPA. This patient had all the features of eGPA, including adult onset asthma, chronic sinusitis, multiple instances of pneumonia, a purpuric rash consistent with vasculitis, some neuropathy, as well as eosinophilia and ANCA positivity. All of these features together make a case for a diagnosis of eGPA. But how can we go about differentiating the different pulmonary eosinophilic syndromes? We've talked a little bit about eGPA and hyper eosinophilic syndromes, but one should also consider acute eosinophilic pneumonia and chronic eosinophilic pneumonia in any patient that presents with pulmonary infiltrate and eosinophilia. How can we distinguish these entities? Well, acute eosinophilic pneumonia usually occurs in otherwise healthy individuals and presents over the course of days, oftentimes with diffuse pulmonary infiltrate and pulmonary respiratory failure. Sometimes there's a recent smoking history, but these patients will often present to the intensive care unit and end up on a ventilator. And it isn't until someone does a bronchoscopy and identifies BAL, bronchoalveolar lavage eosinophilic that a diagnosis of acute eosinophilic pneumonia is uncovered. Usually these patients, these patients present acutely, they get treated with corticosteroids, they do better, and they don't have any chronic manifestations. In contrast, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia is more of an indolent condition that occurs over weeks to months. It can often be associated with asthma and allergy, and oftentimes will have pulmonary infiltrates that are peripheral in nature. These patients will get treated with corticosteroids. They don't usually have other extra pulmonary manifestations. And then they may have relapses frequently uh, that require multiple courses of corticosteroids. There's also the hyper eosinophilic syndrome, such as the myeloproliferative variant or the lymphoproliferative variant. And these patients usually have patchy infiltrates, similar to what's seen in EGPA. They don't usually have a history of asthma or ANCA positivity, and they usually do present with systemic manifestations with cardiac involvement, neurologic involvement, and other organs being involved. They don't have ANCA, and they usually require treatment other than with corticosteroids. 
So let's review our case again. Sandra has all of these features of eGPA, the asthma, the chronic sinusitis, the pulmonary infiltrate, the rash, the neuropathy, the eosinophilia, the ankyl-positivity, and the leukocytic classic vasculitis. Anisha, what are your thoughts on this patient case in particular? I think, you know, with her clinical story that sort of developed over the course of this conversation, she definitely has eGPA. We've got um, all of the different pieces that you talked about and the biopsy findings that are sort of a little bit supportive. You don't have, you know, necessarily the eosinophilia being mentioned here. Um, but the purpuric rash, she has both basically eosinophilic and vasculitic manifestations of the disease. I think for me, one of the hard ones that you just sort of talked about was differentiating between a chronic eosinophilic pneumonia and um, eGPA. And I think looking for those sort of extra pulmonary manifestations is, is one of the real clues here. Um, and so in this patient, you know, you see that she's got the skin lesion, that she's got the neurologic involvement. So I think she has a pretty full picture that, that convinces me she needs treatment for severe disease, especially given her neurologic involvement. This seems like a big textbook case of eGPA, but mm -hmm. most patients don't present with as clear-cut a diagnosis as this one. I think that was a great case, and I want to thank you, Dr. Dua. I think we've learned a lot today. So let's review our SMART goals. Our goals were to investigate eGPA in patients with asthma and eosinophilia, to utilize eGPA consensus task force criteria to diagnose eGPA, to utilize American College Rheumatology criteria to differentiate eGPA from other vascular disease. And we also wanted to make sure that you know a good differential diagnosis for eosinophilia. We hope you'll also view the other parts of our educational series on eGPA. These activities, as well as many other educational resources, can be found online at the CME Outfitters Virtual Education Hub. To receive CME or Continuing Education Credit for today's program, please complete the post-test and evaluation, and you'll be able to download a print and print your certificate immediately upon completion. So thank you again for joining us today. And thank you again to Dr. Dua for this great discussion. Take care, everyone, and have a great day.